Last week we read about the beginning of the church in Thessalonica. Read about Paul uh, being in the second missionary journey and uh, how that church came into existence. And we learned uh, much about what it means to plant a church, to start a church. Well, of course, after that happens, Paul moves on but sends Timothy, a young preacher, back to the church at Thessalonica. Well, while Paul's at Corinth, Timothy returns to Paul and gives him news about these Christians. Timothy says, first of all, they're steadfast, they're faithful, but they have some concerns about the second coming of Christ. So Paul is very quick to respond to them. And so he writes them this letter that we call 1 Thessalonians. And as we read this, this letter or this book, it's one of the earliest documents of the church. Probably written a little over 20 years after the beginning of the church. So as we, again, as we read this letter, you need to put yourselves in the shoes of these Thessalonian Christians because they were, they were new Christians. When Paul writes to them, they've been a Christian probably less than a year. The church there is new. The religion is new. Christianity is new. It's only been in existence a little over 20 years. So here they are, this group of, of believers in Thessalonica, which was a major center of commerce. It was uh, a very pagan city, all kinds of pagan religions. And so you are now part of this, uh, this, this Christianity. You're part of this church of Christ. You're part of this body of Christ. And so you have lots of questions. And so Paul writes them this, this very personal letter uh, responding to their concerns. And the first concern we're going to look at tonight or this morning is about being grateful. Being grateful. It seems like an odd way to start this letter, but Paul does that quite often. When you look at his letters, a lot of times one of the first things he talks about is being thankful and, and having gratitude. And so these first five verses in this letter... And, of course, Paul didn't write in verses. There were no verses back in the first century. It was just a letter written. What we're going to do is we're going to read those five, first five verses, and we're going to see five principles that Paul teaches them about how to learn to have gratitude. Let's read the first five verses, and we'll go back and look at each one of them. So he begins with a fairly typical greeting. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So he mentions five things, one in each of these verses, about what they need to do to make sure they are grateful people. Number one is in the first verse, they and we need to remember we are in God. Number one, we need to remember we are in God. So Paul wishes God's favor, his grace and peace be granted to these Thessalonian Christians. It says grace to you and peace. This is the peace that Paul talks about when he wrote to the church in Philippi and said this is what guards your hearts and minds in Christ. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. That's the same peace. So Paul says be thankful that you are in God. Be thankful you are in God. So this greeting, if that's what we want to call it, reminds us that we Christians are in God. But what does that mean? Well, it means that those of us who have been 
who believe, we've confessed, we've repented, we've been baptized, are in Christ. That's what Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27 tells us. For all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So those are the ones he's addressing. He says you are in God. And notice he doesn't say just in Christ. He says you're in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the, the sphere in which they live. They're in God. So Paul says this is one thing you need to learn to be grateful for. You're a new Christian. You're a part of a new religion. You're a follower of Christ. Remember where you live. The sphere you operate in is in God. He says that is a great reason to be thankful. You are a very special people. And we're very special today. Remember in Jesus' prayer near the end of that prayer in John chapter 17? Remember he prays for himself first in that, in that prayer. And then he prays for the apostles. Then he prays for all disciples. And you know what he prays for? Verses 20 and 21 he prays that they would all be just like he is in the Father and the Father is in him. He prays that they would be in them. See, God's people, Christians, are in God. No other group of people on earth are. No wonder we're called God's prized possession. We're his treasure because we're in him unlike any other group of people on earth. So he says, Thessalonians, this is, this is one thing you need to learn that will help you to be grateful is to remember you are in God and in Christ Jesus. William Barclay wrote, he says, as a result, God was the very atmosphere in which the church lived and moved and had its being. This should be a source of daily encouragement. Why? Because of where we are. Yeah, we live in this world, but far more importantly, we're in God and we're in Christ. And that, that's the only thing we need to be grateful for. I mean, that is, that's enough, isn't it? Because we're in God. If you ever have a chance to read Psalm 121, maybe you have a chance to read that this afternoon. Read the whole psalm. It's not that long. But that psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving and, and it revolves around the blessings you have by being in God and what God does for you. And remember that you are a very special people. See, these were new Christians. They had not, they had not even been in Christ for a year. So Paul says, you're very special. You're treasured. You're prized because you live and move and have your being in God. Unlike any of those pagan religions that, that, that they were living amongst, none of those could claim to be in God. So, number one, remember they, remember we are in God. And because of that, we have His grace and His peace. Verse number two gives us the second thing that helps us to learn gratitude, to learn to be grateful people. He says in verse two, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Why is this so important? Why did Paul go to the trouble to say we are continually, present tense, we're continuing to give thanks for you always? Because he knew it was important that they heard that. They needed to know that the person that helped found that church, that taught them the gospel, was praying for them continually. And he was thankful for them continually. That's what they needed to know. They needed to hear that. And I think we need to tell people the same thing. We need to tell people that. Whenever we're praying for someone or we're thankful for someone, don't keep it to yourself. That's what Paul's saying. He says, go tell them. I know I want to hear that. And, and, and I 
need to hear that you're praying for me. That's what Paul's saying here. When you are praying for somebody, make sure you tell them you're praying for them. That's what Paul's doing. That's exactly what he's doing in verse number 2. He's been praying for them. He's thankful for them. So what is do, he doing? I'm going to tell you that. Paul says that is important that we know people are praying for us and are thankful for us. So tell them. Paul says it's critical. Don't forget to do it. It's a part of learning how to be grateful. He's giving thanks for other people. It's a great idea. Along with that, in Ephesians chapter 5, we go back just a few pages in your Bible. <clears throat> Paul, when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, and this was some 10 years after he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this, <clears throat> giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things. So what does that mean? It means that we need to be looking for things to be thankful for. I was thinking about that this morning um, when I was sitting in my chair after I was ready, thinking about things to be thankful for. Here's a list. There's only seven, but there, there are more than seven things to be thankful for. But here are seven things. Sometimes these are things that I, I was reading and these things came up and you may think, well, that doesn't seem very important. Well, it'll be important to the person that you thank. Someone opening a door for you. You think that's just so unimportant. Uh, it's, it's important. See, Paul said, giving thanks always for all things. So it'll help you and it'll help the person that opened the door for you. If you go somewhere this, uh, here in a little while to, to eat, uh, a waitress refilling your coffee. See, that doesn't seem, isn't that their job? Well, yeah, that's their job. You can still be thankful for it. This morning, if your car started, sometimes it doesn't always do that. Mine didn't a couple of weeks ago. I was stranded in Joplin for a while. Seems kind of small. One of those things you just assume will happen. The car's going to start. That's its job. Clean water. This one I, I was reading about this, this from a missionary. And one of the things we don't think much about here in this country, about having clean water, just one of those things we assume a hot shower. Millions and millions and millions of people don't get to take a hot shower. Number six was honesty in others. You ever been thankful that people are honest? Even when they tell you something you may not want to hear. <laughs> and the seventh thing I wrote down was Jobs that you don't have to do. There's a lot of jobs in the world I'm glad I don't have to do. I mean, there's a huge list of those things. Those were seven kind of unusual things that I think Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 deals with. Giving thanks for all things. All things. And then be thankful to God for them. Number three, these Thessalonian Christians, in learning to be grateful, Paul said in verse 3, that they need to be thankful for godly lives. Notice what he says. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Paul was thankful for those three things. Remembering without ceasing. So Paul was constantly thinking about the good works, the good actions of these Christians. They were done in God's sight. God was fully aware of them. So he mentions three areas. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, just some of the things we did. And I say we loosely. I didn't do a lot of them. But some of the things that was done yesterday. 
here at the church building. They weren't glamorous things. Nobody did anything glamorous yesterday. That's for sure. It wasn't glamorous stuff. But they were good things, very good things. So Paul mentions three areas. He says, first of all, he says, I'm thankful for your work of faith. They did not have a dead faith, did they? Their faith was alive and it was active and Paul was thankful for it because it produced works of service. Go back a few pages to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Notice what Paul says in verse 6. This has so much to do with what he's talking about in, in this Thessalonian letter. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus, see there's that sphere of activity again, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. What's faith supposed to do? It's supposed to work. Right? So he says, the work of faith. Well, this faith had first led them to repent and be baptized. That was the first thing that faith did, led them to be baptized. Then it produced in them works of service. Action. It caused them to do things, important things. He says, I'm thankful, next of all, for your <clears throat> labor of love. Labor of love. You know, those who love little, work little. Those who love little, work little. But these brethren had so much love for God and for each other, that they were laboring, working diligently. This is the agape love. This is the sacrificial love. This is the love that, that is always looking out for someone's best interest. They're concerned about other people and what they really, really need. That's the kind of love. We need to look for the good in the lives of other people. That's what Paul is saying. Look for the good that they're doing. And then finally, he says, I'm thankful for the patience of hope or the endurance or the steadfastness of hope. This hope is not a wish. This is a confident expectation. That's what this hope is. So because of that, they were able to endure all kinds of difficulties. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes about this. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. <clears throat> Paul writes, beginning in verse 23 of Romans 8, Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that's seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Paul was thankful for that. Work was produced by their faith, labor produced by their love, patience produced by their hope. And now my question is, what should these three things look like in our lives? What should the work of faith look like? What should labor of love look like? What should patience of hope look like in our lives and in the life of this congregation? What should it look like on a daily basis? that work of faith. What does faith working look like? What does love laboring look like? What does hope being steadfast and enduring look like? How is it manifested physically or practically in our lives? See, Paul knew that these Thessalonian Christians were, were doing those things and he was thankful for them. So the lesson for us is we need to be thankful for each other's Labor of love and, and faith working and hope enduring. We need to be thankful for those things. The fourth principle Paul is wanting these Thessalonian Christians to understand is to thank God for the election. Verse 4, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. And that's not a very good translation 
The phrase by God in that verse actually in the original describes the beloved brethren. They're beloved by God. And who are they? They're the elect. So he says, here's two specific reasons to be thankful. They were loved by God and they were, they were the elect. You're beloved and you're the elect. It's the same people. New Testament Christians, members of the Lord's church, they are the elect. So we can know who the elect are. I know who the elect are, don't you? It's not some mysterious group of people that only God knows. That's not who the elect are. The elect are simply those who are Christians. Those are the elect, the body of Christ. They are the ones. And we need to be thankful for those who are the elect. Of course, sadly, the religious world, like many other things, has, has greatly abused the meaning of election. These are ones who are picked out or chosen. But they're called, they're picked out, they're chosen by the gospel. That's what, when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in several weeks, We'll see that very thing. So men have a choice when they hear the gospel. They can accept it or they can reject it. Well, if they accept it, what have they done? They have elected to be saved as God has told them. They were called by the gospel and then they have elected, they have chosen to do what God says. That's how they are the elect. Personal choice. And that's the only way they are the elect. So they've elected to do what God wanted them to do. So when we look out at each other, we're looking at people who are the elect. I like to think about myself like that. I'm part of the elect. Well, so are you if you've been saved by the gospel. You're part of the elect. The chosen. Going back again to the fact that we are God's special possession. We're His prized possession. We're His treasure. And as such, we should act that way. We should act knowing that very thing. And then the fifth thing that Paul is wanting these Thessalonian Christians to learn about being grateful he says, thank God for the gospel. Verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. The gospel Paul preached to them came through words and was accompanied by power. It was accompanied by conviction and assurance and it was accompanied by miracles. That was the purpose of miracles. That's why we don't have miracles today. Those miracles in the first century were there for what purpose? To confirm the word, to show that it came from God. It was powerful. And Paul said, this gospel came to you that way. It used words, right? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Words the Holy Spirit taught. It came through words, but it was accompanied by power. In the very next chapter of 1 Thessalonians, notice what he says in verse 13 of chapter 2. Paul writes, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. These words, the Word of God, works in you who believe. And Paul said, we brought this gospel to you for your sake. When we teach people the gospel, when we preach to people the gospel, what are we doing? We're doing it for their sakes. Because it's the power of God into salvation. It's what they need to hear. It comes from God. It's the truth. And it reveals to them how they can be saved. That's why it's so important. Be thankful for the gospel. Those of us in God, in Christ, need to be thankful that someone taught us. Teachers and preachers and parents and friends, whoever it might have been, that they taught you the gospel. 
Be thankful for them and be thankful for the gospel and for its power because it's the only thing that can save. So no wonder Paul ends this kind of introduction by telling them, be thankful for the gospel. And if you're thankful for the gospel, you will be a people who are grateful. You will be grateful. What have we learned? Well, we learned that there are many things we as Christians should be grateful for. Many things. But all of what he mentions here in this beginning is all about being grateful for who you are. Because you're the elect. You're in God. You're in Christ. You're in the body. Be thankful for that. Be thankful that you heard the gospel, you received the gospel, you accepted the gospel, and you obeyed the gospel. Be thankful for that. Be thankful for the gospel and the fact that it exists. We should be thankful for all of that. And we need to be thankful that we are God's special people. We are treasured by Him. We're His special possession. That will forever cause us to be a grateful people and should motivate us to live that way, that we're special. There may be people this morning who have heard the gospel but have not yet acted upon it. We've mentioned this morning that to get into Christ, one must believe that He's the Messiah, the Chosen One, that He died on the cross and was resurrected, that you must repent of your lives, turn your life around and turn it to Him, confess before men your beliefs and then be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. You then become part of the elect, God's special people. You're placed in God. You're placed in Christ, in the body of Christ. You become His prized possession. This morning, if that is your desire, we encourage you to step out and obey that gospel. Let us stand and sing this song.